So a couple of weeks ago, I went to CERN to film some videos on antimatter and the Higgs boson. And whilst I was there, I must have chatted to about six particle physicists for about half an hour each. And then in the end, only used something like two to three minutes max of each of those conversations in my videos. So I figured the best thing to do was just put the entire chat online so that we all can enjoy them together. So here's my chat with particle physicist, Dr. Clara Nellist, all about the Higgs boson. Um, so I guess, how would, how would you describe um, the Higgs field, the Higgs boson, to, to someone who wasn't sure what it was? Uh, I mean, I think the best way to, the, the best analogy that I've heard for describing the Higgs boson is um, the, the snow field. So if, I haven't heard of this. Have you not heard this? No, one? no, so please tell me. I heard it from John Ellis, who's a, a theorist here at CERN. Um, so... He talks about how um, if you have a field of snow, um, the way that you interact with that snow, the, the snow is the Higgs field, mm -hmm. and the way that you interact with the snow is how you interact with the Higgs field. Um, so if, for example, you've got a pair of skis mm -hmm. and you're just sliding on top of the snow, then you're either a very light particle or you have no mass at all because you're not really interacting with the mm -hmm. snow, you're just sliding on top of it. Uh, if you have snowshoes, then um, you're kind of able to go through the snow. It's a bit easier, so you're having some interaction, but not so much. So that would be maybe like an electron, a light particle. Um, and if you have no snowshoes at all and you're just in some tiny boots, then you're really going to sink in. It's going to be super hard to get through uh, the snow field. And so that's like a top part that's really heavy. Yeah. Um, and then the Higgs boson itself is, is like a snowball. It's like the Higgs field interacting with itself. That's so and cool. That's how you can... Uh, imagine the boson. Yeah, I've never that sort of self interaction of like the Higgs field and the Higgs boson is what gives stuff mass, but it can also give itself mass. Yeah, that's such a good way of thinking about it as a, a snowball. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So, we, were you around when the Higgs was discovered at CERN or not? Yes, so I was a, a young PhD student just a few years into my PhD. Um, so, I was working on the pixel detector, so I wasn't really uh, involved in the analysis, but I'd heard rumors. And I'd heard people talking. So even though we're a big collaboration, it was still kept quite hush-hush because you didn't want any leaks to get out. Um, and so we we knew that the announcement was going to happen. I mean, there was an announcement in 2011 um, with some updates, and we knew it was a massive thing. And some of my friends said, why don't we try and get into the room? Um, and we knew the only way of getting into the room would be the first people at the queue outside. So we turned up at midnight the night before the um, announcement and we had snacks, we had laptops with movies, um, like pillows and blankets and we camped there all night and um, we were about 10th or 11th into the room. Wow. Um, so I was right at the back in the middle and got to watch the whole thing live. That's so cool. So yeah. you're there like that historic announcement. I love the idea of like some people camp out for movies or for gigs and you're there like camp out for the biggest scientific announcement of my, you know, yeah. or my scientific career so far, I guess. You don't want to say ever, you know, because yeah, there could well, be bigger hopefully ones. Not. Hopefully there's more. But um, yeah. yeah, no, it really felt like a rock concert. Like everybody was so excited. There were cameras, there were security guards. Um, so Steph Hills, who works at the STFC in the UK, was uh, the bodyguard for a uh, for, uh, Peter Higgs himself. Nice. Um, so, <laughs> it's a big job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what was the atmosphere like here at CERN for that whole day? I mean, the, like, it must have been really exciting for people, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was electric. I mean, uh, everybody was excited. Nobody was doing any other work apart from going to this talk. Um, it, was, it was interesting the way that they did it because it was very much a scientific talk for the scientific community and then afterwards uh, they had a press conference uh, for journalists so we had a, I think an hour talk from each um, of the experiments and then at the end the DG at the time Rolf Hoyer was like I think we've got it nice. um, and there was cheers and <laughs> I mean there's this famous photo of uh, Peter Higgs uh, with teary eyes because you know he got to see uh, his theory yeah. uh, that he worked on with other theorists yeah. uh, come true. Yeah, the thing that he'd spent his life doing yeah, yeah. come to fruition. That must have been amazing to be in the room with him to see that emotion sort of hit his face. Yeah, it was it was really great and it's it's very inspiring as a young scientist to have been able to be there and to feel part of the moment and then to go on to work on the Higgs myself afterwards. It's It was very special. Yeah, yeah. And nice. then we celebrated in the restaurant here at CERN afterwards and uh, <laughs> People nice. knew which, the, which ones the Brits were because we had a bottle of Pims on the table <laughs> <laughs> to nice. celebrate, yeah. yeah. So how do you actually go about like producing a Higgs boson? Are they, are they there everywhere? Can we? Is it just a matter of detecting them or do we have to physically make them to find them? So everything we do here at CERN happens 
around us anyway. So cosmic rays that come into our atmosphere create these kind of particle collisions. And um, so Higgs bosons are forming uh, in our atmosphere and they're happening in lots of other astrophysical uh, <laughs> situations. But we want to be able to measure them. And the best way to measure them is to do it in a very controlled way. Um, so here at CERN, we have the Large Hadron Collider, um, our favorite particle accelerator. And we take protons, um, we accelerate them to the speed of light, we smash them together, and we use E equals mc squared to take this energy and create new matter. Um, and then the Higgs bosons are created, so it's a statistical chance uh, of what will be created, we never know, um, but our calculations tell us uh, how often it should happen. Um, and then again, they will change into other particles because they don't uh, live for very long. Uh, they're, we, they're what we call unstable. Um, and then these other particles come out a bit like a, like a firework in that kind of spray. Um, so this happens in the center of our detector. And then we've built like an onion around this collision point, lots of different types of uh, detectors that we can see behind us is uh, one of them. Um, and each detector has a different role in measuring the particles. And then we can think of it like a fingerprint, like my fingerprint is different to your fingerprint, mm -hmm. and a Higgs boson changing into tau particles is different, uh, has a different fingerprint than uh, a Higgs boson turning into muons. Mm -hmm. um, so our detector then measures um, these different particles and we can reconstruct it, uh, work out the, the mass of the particle, uh, that created it and from which particles it interacted with and the mass and all this other information we can say that one was probably a Higgs boson and it probably changed into two tau particles that then mm -hmm. decayed in different ways. It's almost like particle forensics mm -hmm. like you see the aftermath of this sort of incredible firework explosion as you described it and then you have to piece together yeah. back to what happened sort of at that moment of, of impact and creation. Yeah and we have to do this thousands of times a, a second uh, throughout the year. Um, so we have billions and billions of collisions, but we've trained our computer algorithms to work out uh, what different particles look like, and then we can we can plot these into, into graphs. Nice. Yeah. So the, on, the onion-like structure, is that sort of a detector to detect like the tau particles and a detector for the muons, or is it a detector for like, uh, you know, the particles that go off in different directions kind of thing? Um, so they all tend to come off in a, in a similar direction. Um, but each segment has a role. So we have a tracking detector that's right at the center and that tracks um, where charged particles have gone. And we use magnets to bend them because this tells us which charge they have. Uh, then we have uh, two segments that measure the energy. So we have the electromagnetic and the hadronic calorimeters. So these measure the energy of the particles in different ways. And then we do actually have a muon system on the outside uh, because muons, uh, they do interact on the way, but they don't get stopped. And so they're the last particles that we can measure on the outside of the detector. And then the only things that we don't measure are neutrinos or potentially dark matter uh, particles like that. So we call that missing uh, transverse momentum. Um, so because momentum has to be conserved, we can work out where it's gone when mm -hmm. we don't measure it. So if the momentum is missing from a particle sort of decay, you might think that that could be something that we can't detect. That could be a dark matter thing has been created there. And could that give you clues about what dark matter is maybe? So it would tell us, so for example, if you had a big spray of particles coming this way, but nothing this way, we would want the momentum to be conserved. Um, so we would say that something came off this direction. And then we would look at what type of particles uh, were created. So that's how we would then, like the forensic science, track back and mm. try to think, okay, what could interact with these particles in this way mm. to create this energy? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's this particle. And then we, we would add up all of the hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of events um, to work out what it might be. Yeah. But one of the big problems is um, if there are multiple. So mm -hmm. there could be two dark matter uh, particles that come off like this, and we don't know if there's two or if it's one mm -hmm. uh, heavier mass particle or, mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you think is like next for work on the Higgs? Obviously we've discovered it now, mm -hmm. um, but like where to next? There must be so many things that we still don't know about it and we still want to find out. Yeah, so the, the first thing was to discover a new particle, which we did. Then we wanted to prove that it was the Higgs boson, mm -hmm. um, which we did, but we're still testing it um, because there are different theories within particle physics that have slightly different uh, properties for the Higgs boson and how it will interact with other particles. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, 
we have three generations of, uh, of particles. So we have the electron, uh, the muon and the tau. Um, so they're essentially the same particle, but uh, they go heavier, get heavier each time. Um, and so because the Higgs boson or the Higgs field rather, um, the more it interacts with the particle, the more mass they have. We assume that it should uh, interact with the tau particles more than, for example, the muons or the electrons. Mm -hmm. um, so we can do measurements like these uh, to test. Uh, we, we look for an event within our detector. Um, so we have the protons come in, they collide. Uh, this energy, we use E equals mc squared, uh, creates a Higgs boson and then it can change into other particles because it, it doesn't like to stay as a Higgs boson and changes into other particles. And so when it changes into tau particles, we can measure this in our detector and we count it. And then if it changes into muons, we measure this in our detector and we count that as well. And we expect there to be more uh, tau particles from Higgs bosons. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we found in this case, um, but we also haven't been able to measure yet the electron. Because it's so light, it, it happens less often and so this is another confirmation that we could do to, to see if the Higgs boson is really interacting as it should do. Nice. So what is the current research question that you're trying to answer now? So now, um, I mean, I was working on the, directly on the Higgs boson before. Um, so I was looking uh, at how it interacted with these tau particles. Uh, then I moved on to looking at, um, because top quarks are actually heavier than the Higgs boson. And when particles change into each other in the detector, they, they go to lighter mass. Um, so we can't create top quarks normally within the standard model from a Higgs boson, but we can have two top quarks and create a Higgs boson from that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a really important measurement uh, because uh, we, we want to see if the Higgs boson interacts with other bosons, so other force carrying particles uh, as expected, and also into fermions, so the matter, the stuff particles. So the tau particles are one type of uh, fermions, but the top quark is a different type of fermion. Um, so this is a really important measurement. And since it's the heaviest particle we expect it that we know of so far, we expect it to um, interact the most mm -hmm. with the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. And we also expect it if there are other, uh, if there's other physics happening, if there's something else out there, that maybe this interaction is the key to unlocking it, to seeing hints. Um, so we're measuring this to get the most precise, uh, call it the coupling between yeah. the two particles. Um, and then I'm also starting to move away and to look for um, dark matter. And one possible candidate of the dark matter is uh, from the supersymmetry theory of extra Higgs bosons. Oh. Well, just the supersymmetry theory would predict a dark matter. And if we found extra Higgs bosons, this would help prove the supersymmetry theory. Right, okay. So, so not the Higgs boson themselves is dark matter, but extra Higgs bosons would be like, oh, there could be that dark matter in supersymmetry. Yeah. Nice. That's yeah. really cool that the Higgs boson could lead to that like unsolved mystery in, in physics. Like for, I mean, someone is an astrophysicist, I guess so much yeah, about yeah. that as well. So maybe I, you know, should get really excited about the future of the Higgs boson. Yeah, so we, we sometimes call it a portal or a key, uh, like a way to look for new physics. It's um, that stepping stone mm -hmm. into what else could be out there. So uh, you talked about how these particles were created very randomly in that moment of collision and sort mm. of matter from energy. But is there any way that we'd ever be able to almost design that collision so that you could design what came out of it? Um, yeah, so we have actually done this before, um, but it's the nature of the hadron part of the Large Hadron Collider. So because we're colliding protons, and protons are made up of three quarks, uh, gluons, and then some extra C quarks inside. So we don't know exactly which particle collides with each other mm -hmm. to create the, the new particle that we're interested in. But if we had something like a lepton uh, collider, so we used to have an electron-positron collider here at CERN, and this, we know exactly what's colliding and we can decide exactly the energy of which to collide them with. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for the Higgs boson and you want to measure its mass really precisely, you would slowly increase the energy of your lepton collider to the Higgs mass and you would see this mm -hmm. sharp increase uh, in production. Um, so other things could be created as well, but the likelihood is mm -hmm. that you would create a Higgs boson at that mass peak. Yeah. So perhaps in the future, if we have a lepton collider that um, can collide at energies of the Higgs mass, then we could use it as uh, what would be called a Higgs factory. Mm. Um, a so Higgs factory. A Higgs I factory. like that. Yeah. Um, and then we sounds can really... like you're just churning out Peter Higgs. But... <laughs> <laughs> 
right, then you could work. So. Then, then we can really study its properties even more precisely because we know that it's a Higgs boson and we don't have... Uh, one of the problems with a Hadron Collider is that you have what's called pile-up and it's just all these jets of particles that come from the, the collision of this messy proton. Um, so that, that would be a cleaner way to, yeah. to measure it. So with the, with the, if the future is a Higgs factory, does that mean sort of a design of a new particle accelerator here at CERN? Um, so this is one thing that's being discussed, but um, it, there's no uh, decision yet. So there are a couple of um, different proposals for here at CERN, and then there's one in Japan, one in China. Um, so as a community, we're discussing the, the various options, and we have to see also where the commitments from people with money uh, comes from <laughs> yeah and is that sort of like bigger and better or is it just different designs is it circles again or would it be linear accelerators do you think or? um so one of the designs is like the lhc but bigger mm -hmm. um so one of the limitations we have is the magnets uh for the large hadron collider this defines the energy that mm -hmm. we can collide at so either we can have uh, stronger magnets or we can build it uh, at a bigger radius a bigger circumference um or we could do both and then we have even higher energy um, so there's one proposal for that to be a proton collider or to have leptons uh, in that ring. Um, but there's also linear options. So rather than having a big circle, um, you can have a linear collider uh, where you collide them head on. Um, and that, that would also give us the Higgs factory. Well, what do you like most about working at CERN? I really love being able to um, have the, the time and the freedom mm -hmm. to understand all of the building blocks of our universe. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really want to know how everything works and how it fits together and CERN is such a fantastic place to work because there are so many experts here and so many people doing great research that I can just pop into someone's office and um, ask them a question and, and discuss uh, the things that we're working on. So for example, I know where John Ellis works and if I have a question on supersymmetry, yeah. I can go knock on his door and he's a really nice guy and he'll answer yeah. the questions so yeah it's a really good community here where we can talk to people like your friendly neighborhood theorists yes yeah. exactly <laughs>